All right, welcome everybody. Welcome, welcome to the College of Complexes. We are here every Saturday night from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. We are at 2901 West Madison. We only have a, a couple of rules, and uh, one rule is... 2901 West Madison? Addison. 2901 Addison. West Addison. Addison. One moron at a time, right? One fool at a time. Can we do that? Can we handle that? Yeah. Uh. The other one is, what's the other one? It's no personal attacks, right? No oh. personal attacks, oh. except... And that means we can't do no anything like this. I like that. No punches. Okay, right we can do you emotional punching, though, can we? Yeah, I think so. All right. All within right. within yeah. reason. All right, all right. <laughs> okay, all right. Go so you're going to record or no? I'm recording Ready? now. All right. Today's presenters, we, uh, the title is, Are You Curious About Medical Cannabis? This is meeting number 3402. Medical cannabis, aka medical marijuana, is now available in Illinois. What does it mean to you? Is it safe? How does a patient get it? Kirsten Velasco, patient advocate of Illinois Women of Cannabis, NFP, will answer all your questions with a presentation covering the science. That's always important. The biology, that's important. Laws application process and patient experience followed by an open Q&A. All are welcome. Medical cannabis is safe, natural, non-toxic, anti-inflammatory that can treat chronic pain and many other conditions. It is already saving lives. States of medical cannabis have 25% less death from opioid overdose. Medical cannabis can be formulated to have no psychoactive effect and never needs to be smoked. There are several alternatives, cells, tinctures, capsules, etc. This program is important for everyone, everyone, because of the misconceptions about medical cannabis. It is most beneficial for seniors, most of us in here, veterans, and anyone with a chronic illness. Find out why Illinois and more than 25 other states have their own medical cannabis program. Let's uh, welcome the presenter. I don't think I need the microphone. Do you guys want me to talk no, into the microphone? Yeah. 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 And is it it's stationary or yes, can I take it out? If you want to take it out, go ahead. Okay. Um, I'll remove it for you. I can say I'm delighted to be in a room with all open-minded individuals because cannabis tends to provoke a lot of strong opinions and it's my job to help people become comfortable with talking about cannabis. Now there's going to be a lot of opinions about it and it's natural for us to have these negative feelings and for people to be discouraged from looking into it because there's a lot of labels associated with cannabis. Nobody wants to be in a medical cannabis program if they are worried about their family and friends thinking that they are a pothead or an addict or a junkie or a stoner. So I'm going to make all of you confident enough to talk about cannabis regularly and to recommend it to anyone who you think might benefit. The way I like to start off is to unravel our misconceptions about it. It's been illegal for about 80 years, so it's natural for us all to consider it dangerous, addictive, and damaging to the brain at least. So let's jump in right away with looking at how dangerous cannabis actually is by comparing it to some other common substances. This common substance in the United States every year kills 480,000 people. Does anybody know what that substance is? Alcohol. Yeah, right, Andy. Tobacco. And the next number of deaths per year is 88,000. Does anybody have a guess what that one is? Alcohol. Yes. You guys are so smart. I love you guys. Right? 47,055 deaths per year. Car accidents. Opioids. Okay, it's all drugs together, all drug poisoning. So it could be a Motrin, because sometimes people will take too much of that and it hurts their liver. 
It could go all the way up to the opioids, which there's a well-known crisis now with these really strong pain medications that are known as Vicodin, Oxycontin, Hydrocodone. Now for dramatic effect, the deaths caused by cannabis. Are you guys very well aware of this if you research a little bit before you came tonight? Now I'd like to make that very large because that's not deaths every year just in the United States. That There's never been a death from an overdose of cannabis. And that's very comforting to know. But it is also having an effect lowering the numbers of deaths from the other substances listed above. Patients who have access to medical cannabis report needing less of their other prescription medications. And this is having a great effect in the states where it's available, even though it's not very well known with its limited knowledge, there's always already been data that has documented that there's 25% less death from those opioid overdoses. So it's very comforting, just that one slide should really disassemble a lot of preconceived notions that we have been carrying around for all these years. The next concern is addictiveness. Heroin, nicotine, way at the top for most addictive, and then at the very bottom, right next to cannabis, is caffeine. So that's comforting to know because nobody really has a problem with the addictiveness of caffeine. Cannabis has always been medicine for millennia. Long before the FDA, the DEA, or any modern research, this was used very extensively in medicines here in the United States. It was after prohibition that the focus became making, maximizing the psychoactive effect of cannabis. So the plant was grown specifically to maximize more THC, more THC, because that's that one psychoactive component we know about. So under these mutated conditions of maximized THC, the modern research that we have began in the 1960s in Israel with Dr. Raphael Meshulam. Love this guy, got to meet him at, in Harvard this year. And he was, is famous for isolating THC and synthesizing it so they could analyze what it was actually doing inside the brain. Very, very interesting. We can get more to that later because I like to talk fast and keep your attention. But it's interesting to note that the United States government has been funding his research for decades. And now, PubMed.gov is a website. If you enter cannabinoid there, you're going to find over 20,000 different research articles. It's very comforting to know that this has been extensively studied and researched. It hasn't been given the FDA-style side-by-side blind clinical trials, but there has been researched very extensively. That's very comforting. It should give people a lot of confidence. But there's one more thing that is in the back of our minds, we probably don't think about a lot, and I'm hoping that this will trigger some memories for people. Anything? Anybody? Outer space. This is your brain on drugs. drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Excellent. Thank you. Does cannabis fry your brain? Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, the government owns a patent for its medical use. It's called cannabinoids as antioxidants and neuroprotectants. The cannabinoids are the active medical components in the plant, and neuroprotectants have the unique ability to protect the brain and nerves. So it is documented in this patent that cannabinoids reduce the damage from brain injuries and slow the progression of Parkinson's. We have all of this research, and yet the DEA still classifies this as having no medicinal value. And at the same time, there's a synthetic cannabinoid available by prescription called Marinol. It's a synthetic THC. It's prescribed for nausea and pain, mostly for cancer patients. So now you can understand with all this research, history, the, the science that we have, so many people in so many states have gone to the trouble to create their own medical cannabis program. I've just updated this, so we are up to more than 28 states having some type of access to the plant, and ours in Illinois is called the Medical Cannabis Pilot Program, or Compassionate Care Act, and it's due to expire in 2020. But that's not what's going to happen. This is just a period where we get to examine the functionality of the law and make improvements to it, which there's a lot of room to grow there. So as of right now, we're approximately at 13,000 patients. 
And who are these people? 13,000 people after a, a year of medical availability in Illinois. And I call them pioneers because it takes a lot to get into this program. And I also call them the most desperate and determined people in the state of Illinois because there's so many people who say, I, I, I'm out of options. I have tried absolutely everything. I have got to get off of these other prescription drugs because they're killing my liver, my kidneys, my stomach. And then there are so many other people who say, I have to get off the black market. I don't know what I'm going to get. I don't know how much it's going to cost. I don't know if it has bacteria or mold or fungus. And then these people can't have a job where they could possibly be drug tested. And heaven forbid they should get arrested. So even though there's many requirements to get into this program, we're still getting about 1,000 patients a month. And the very first requirement is to be diagnosed with one of these specific conditions. Now, you'd have to go up close to read these, and I hope that you've not heard of most of these very rare conditions. Many you have heard of cancer, multiple sclerosis, but they'll all fall under the umbrella of one of these. Pain and inflammation, autoimmune diseases like lupus, neurological conditions like ALS, and seizure disorders like epilepsy and Tourette's. Now on this list, if you got to take a close look, you would see that there is rheumatoid arthritis, so a person with rheumatoid arthritis is eligible for the program, but not osteoarthritis, and that doesn't seem right. And we have Crohn's, but not colitis. So it written into the law is an opportunity for patients to petition the state to ask an advisory board to add their petition to the program and this has been done however the politicians who oversee this have refused to follow the law and the patients who petitioned and did not get their conditions added to the program have been represented and have sued the state and we were like oh okay we're gonna sue the state and the judge is gonna be like all right you have to follow the law and that's what the judge said but then the politician said, uh, we're going to appeal that. So we got all excited about adding more conditions to the program, but the government just really is not supportive of it. Now, this is probably a bad week to bash the government. I don't want to, you know, pardon me, Kelly. Thank you. I'm sorry. I don't want to go into any tender area as it is right now. We can get, crack into that later. But here's the thing. I can give everyone a break because... They all think that this is a dangerous, addictive drug and people are going to be impaired. So let's discuss why it is that cannabis can be an effective treatment for more than 41 conditions that we have listed here. The reason why is because our bodies create compounds that are almost identical to the ones in the cannabis plant. When Dr. Raphael Mishulam was studying this, and synthesizing THC so that he could say, oh, how is it that it's causing this psychoactive effect? They saw these plant cannabinoids triggering receptors on cells. Now they said, why is it that a plant compound would trigger a receptor in a human cell? Well, that's how they found out that there's compounds in our bodies that are almost identical <coughs> to the ones in the cannabis plant. Because the studying of the cannabis plant led to the discovery of these intercellular communication system, it is called the endocannabinoid system. And the purpose of the endocannabinoid system is to promote stability and balance through all the systems of the body. The endocannabinoid system stabilizes pain signals, it neutralizes the chemicals that cause inflammation, and it prevents the plaque that causes Alzheimer's. So if a person's endocannabinoid system is not functioning properly, it can be assisted with the cannabinoids in the plant. It was not discovered until 1992. So at this point, it's not really taught in medical schools, and all of you who know how smart you are, smarter than 90% of the doctors about cannabis right now. Now, doctors and you, I'm sure, have all heard of THC, that one psychoactive component. But there are over 100 different cannabinoids in the cannabis plant. And slowly but surely, scientists are discovering the effectiveness of the different cannabinoids. And right now, I feel a little sorry for THC because CBD is taking the spotlight. 
this cannabinoid, which is the second naturally most abundant, abundant cannabinoid, has a long, long list of medical effects. Antibacterial, anti-pain, anti-inflammatory, anti-seizure, anti-tumoral, which I know you guys will want to ask about later, anti-tumoral, and, and anti-anxiety, strong anti-anxiety. Now the reason why people love this, or they're more willing to accept it, is because it does not have the psychoactive effect of THC. Now the thing I like the most about CBD is that it neutralizes the psychoactive effect of THC. So when a patient has a medicine that has a balance of CBD and THC, they get the medical benefits of THC without the psychoactive effect. THC has a lot of other medicinal qualities, bring up the list here, anti-nausea, anti-pain, anti-inflammatory, uh, anti-muscle spasm, appetite stimulant, lowers blood pressure. So what I like to illustrate with this simple combination of CBD and THC is that when the natural plant compo components are combined, it expands the effectiveness and the potential dramatically. This is called the entourage effect. And there's a whole other family of components in the plant called terpenes. Those are the nice smells. Sometimes if you see a documentary, you'll see people smelling the different jars. Those terpenes give the unique smell, but they also have an extremely important effect on the medicinal quality. So when a patient is dialing in what works specifically for them, they will be able to choose a medicine based on the terpenes and the cannabinoid content. Now because the medicine is just evolving organically again from scratch without the support of science like we would want, the approach of most patients is to find a different ratio, a balance of CBD and THC, and start at the lowest dose, make adjustments from there until they find what suits them personally. Now, has anybody ever taken a multivitamin? Okay, great, excellent. This is a very simplified comparison, but it's where I like to illustrate that cannabis and traditional medicine show their separation. Because with traditional medicine, the patient goes in, they get a diagnosis, the doctor makes a prescription, decides on the dosage, and then hopefully the patient complies. But in this situation with medical cannabis, the patient gets to choose their dosage, starting at the lowest amount, making adjustments themselves. And this leaves patients thinking, oh no, I've never done this before, I've never chosen on my own. However, when a patient steps into that power, it's very compelling to know that it's in their hands for their specific unique situation to devise what is best for them. Now I have overwhelmed you with a lot of information I expect you to understand and accept a lot of stuff, so let's do a quick review. Cannabis is non-toxic, anti-inflammatory, neuroprotectant, has many, oh, treat, can treat chronic pain, has many different components, and is customizable. Great, how do we get it? <laughs> that sounds good, right? Well, if a patient has one of these diagnoses in Illinois, the very next step then is to have their doctor verify that for the state. There's a form made by the state, the doctor fills it out and says, yes, this is my patient, and they do have one of the qualifying conditions. The doctor then sends that to the state. But there's many physicians who are just not on board with this program. They don't believe that the law protects them. They're not comfortable with this for the same reasons that we do, are not comfortable with it. If you're not a doctor, they think that it's dangerous and addictive. And they also don't feel comfortable not having control over the dosage. So there's many physicians now in the state that are comfortable with it, and a patient can transfer their records to a doctor who's good with it, then they do the proper procedure to take them on as a patient, and the patient is allowed to keep their former doctor if they like. So once that form is sent to the state, they're on to the very next step, which is their own patient application. That requires a proof of residency, an ID, and a two by two picture that will appear on the medical cannabis card. There's also a fee. Patients are allowed to choose a one, two, or three year card with a fee of $100, $200, or $250. And there is a 50% discount for patients who are on disability, supplemental security income, or veterans. Now veterans 
typically will get their health care at a VA facility, and because that's a federal place, they're not allowed to participate with writing these certifications. So the law wrote a whole other section for veterans where they could just supply a year of their medical records directly from the VA that contains that information about their qualifying condition. The next person that can get a card is a caregiver. So there's many patients who don't have the mobility or the transportation ability to go in and out of the dispensary. The dispensary is where the medicine is sold. So a caregiver applies. They, they do, I'll point with my little, the caregiver does the patient application part and the digital fingerprint scan. And they send that in with their application and they do a $25, $50, or $75 one, two, or three year card. And that allows that caregiver to go right in and out of the dispensary for the patient. Minors are also allowed to participate in the program, but they need two physician certifications and a parent would be their caregiver. Now, the next step is that each card is designated to one dispensary where they purchase the medicine. And that's because the state tracks the amount of medicine that the patient purchases. And that's typically got a limit of two and a half ounces of dried flour every 14 days. Now, I've gotten past all the boring stuff because now we get to talk about the flowers. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> Any patient that is new to cannabis, the first thing that they say is, do I have to smoke it? No. And am I going to be stoned on the couch all day? Well, we know it can be formulated to have no psychoactive effect. And it's also a relief to know that no one ever has to smoke cannabis. Smoking is outdated. The intense heat destroys most of the medicine, and it can irritate the lungs, and it has that very noticeable and identifiable smell, which is why the state asks it to be consumed inside the home, privately. However, vaporization is taking its place. It does not have the smell. With vaporization, the flowers or an extracted oil from the flowers is heated up to a specific temperature that releases the medicine into a vapor that's inhaled. So with this method, there's no smell, people love it, and the important thing about inhalation is that it allows the medicine to take effect in as little as 30 seconds, and when people are in pain, every second counts. So inhalation is very important. The next option for a patient is called sublingual. This is where an oil is held inside the mouth and it actually gets into the bloodstream right through the mucous membrane of the mouth and can take effect in as little as 15 minutes. With, with sublingual or with inhalation, the effects will typically last two to three hours. So the next option is called edibles, which I'm sure you guys have heard of the traditional pot brownie from the vernacular. Now, and anything extracted from the plant can be infused into any number of foods and drinks. But here's the thing with edibles. It can take an hour and a half to two hours to take effect, but the effects last for double of sublingual and inhalation. Yeah. So you can get four to six hours of effect. Yeah, yeah gotta be careful though, you guys. Not, not to be trifled with. But I like to illustrate here that because of all these different choices, patients are able to maybe have an edible before they go to bed, they get the best night of sleep they've ever had, then when they wake up in the morning, that edible is starting to wear off and they think, oh no, it's going to be an hour and a half before my next edible takes effect. They can do a, vapor a vaporizer inhalation that takes effect right away and it gives a bridge then until the edible takes effect to control their pain. So the next method of, of consumption is a combination of edibles and sublingual. It's just a lozenge or a, a caramel because some of the medicine is, stays in the mouth and goes right into the bloodstream and it takes effect more quickly. Some of it's swallowed and gives a longer duration of effects. The next method that I like to talk about is topicals. And this is just a phenomenal method for people who are a little bit apprehensive about the program. It's so nice that they think, oh, I can just put a salve on my knuckles that have arthritis, sleep through the night. How simple, easy. Just a great way to introduce the medicine to someone who's just a little bit more apprehensive. And the last method of consumption is just a capsule. So simple, just imagine being able to choose the cannabinoid content, extract the oil, put it into a capsule, and that's the preferred method of Colton Turner. 
He's from here in Illinois, but now he lives in Colorado because he was so sick with Crohn's that he was losing weight and his parents were pushing him around in a wheelchair and they were so worried. And I have friends on Facebook with them because they're activists. I'm kind of in that community. They don't know who I am. But they are the salt of the earth, most American couple you have ever met. And to think of them picking up their family and moving to Colorado, but they did. And now Colton's Crohn's is in remission and he's able to take three capsules throughout the day that are high in CBD, then one capsule at night that's high in THC. With all of these methods of consumption and different cannabinoid ratios, patients are confused. It's a new medicine, it's a new method of, of taking it and a new method for them to think about. So when they go into the dispensary with their card, they are able to consult with a professional dispensary technician or a patient care specialist, as they're called. And the patient is allowed to just describe the symptoms that they're trying to treat. They don't have to reveal any personal information. And just that is enough for them to set up a protocol, go home and try it out, and then come back in and discuss that with the patient care specialist, and then go from there and make different adjustments and keep record of what they do. Now, what I have up in these pictures are actual Illinois dispensaries. And when I, when I was first starting this out and preparing, none, none of the dispensaries had even opened, and I thought that they would look like uh, optometrist office. But they're even better, because everybody who wanted to be in this industry thought, we have to raise the bar so high that we will exceed everyone's expectations. And sure enough, these places are absolutely beautiful. And the feedback is that patients feel so cared for, they don't feel rushed, they feel very important, like they were remembered, which is getting to be a very opposite experience than what they're used to now with the professional medical industry. And as the night has gone on, I've asked you to let go of those ideas that this is a dangerous, addictive drug that will fry your brain. So I want to give you something to replace this. Here's a fun image. And I joke about this when I was little and I was coloring. This must have been the first word they ever learned was non-toxic on the Crayola box. And no one wants to eat a box of Crayolas. They should, everybody should be well informed that even with cannabis, even though it is non-toxic, that information is the key. If, if there's more information and people are comfortable, they're not going to do stupid things with this medicine and have mistakes or emergency room visits. And there, no, cannabis, just take, this is your, this is your little sound bite. Cannabis is a non-toxic anti-inflammatory that can treat chronic pain and many other conditions. And in every group, there will be at least one person who thinks, oh, oh my gosh, we have to get this information out as quickly as possible. So the people try this right away instead of waiting until they have exhausted all the other options. So for people who like to get involved and help to spread the word and make people feel comfortable about this, there are several organizations that are working constantly to advance the laws to make cannabis more accessible. And here in Illinois, men and women are welcome to join Illinois Women in Cannabis. It was founded here because we wanted women to have an equal <coughs> role in the new industry. There's no glass ceiling as of yet. And women are really responsible for a majority of the health decisions made in the home. Now, Illinois Women in Cannabis, the best networking events, parties for people who want to be in the industry. We do charitable initiatives and we do educational events like this. So anybody who likes to speak and wants to go out and talk about cannabis, please join <laughs> Illinois Women in Cannabis because we really love to do another cannabis education campaign. Because you know what, in, in a room like this you might think, my gosh, that was fantastic information, but you know who should have been here who would really benefit from this? So that's what we're trying to do, is to really expand this out so it can be normalized. I'm happy to answer some questions, but here's the easiest way to participate in the community, is to go on Facebook to Illinois Medical Cannabis Community. This is a very positive, very professional environment where patients and their families ask all kinds of questions. They ask questions about new products that have come out. They say, oh, who's your favorite cultivator? The, the, the cultivators grow the medicine. And then they talk about their results that they have with the different strains that are available. So it's a phenomenal place just to go right out and find out what it's like out there. Now, I'm happy to answer your questions. There's lots and lots of questions. That I, this is a service that 
provides assistance to give a referral to a physician and to help assistance with the actual application process. So is it safe for me to stop here and open up for questions? Yes. Great. Okay. All right. Should I just go? Let's go, go ahead. I work at a place where they randomly do the drug test, but uh, that ointment that you were talking about, would that show up in the drug test? That will never give you a positive test. It's just, it, there's not enough to get your blood levels up to where they can find it. Yeah, it's ironic when you said, you know, there's uh, someone that should be here, uh, but uh, some of them can't be. Uh, my uh, neighbor's mother is uh, undergoing uh, chemo, so, you know, she's not physically able to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm a patient, and I went to the dispensary yesterday, and I said, you know, if someone's having to go into chemo, is there an expedited process to get the card? Because it took uh, a month and a half for my card to arrive. Yes. And there, they said no, there's, uh, there, they weren't aware of it. I figured out a question out of your statement, which was, is there a application process for terminal patients? If a doctor, no matter what the condition is, has said you have six months to live, then there are no fees, there is no digital fingerprint background check, and the guaranteed two-week turnaround time. So that's a new facet of the law. Thank you for waiting. Yes? Yeah, Kirsten, if cannabis is a medicine, what does it cure? What illness does it cure? Well, cure is a very strong word, so if we're going to get into the legalese of cure, it doesn't really cure yeah, anything, but it question. treats many, many conditions. And as a matter of fact, we can go into curing cancer because the results compared to chemo and radiation are phenomenal. C cannabis works very well together with traditional cancer treatments. But do you want me to go into the cellular effect of cannabis yes. uh, about cancer? Yes. Just tell me what illness to cure. <clears throat> I just said it doesn't it. cure anything. It treats many, many things. I've heard alternative people claim that if sitting here at the college that a, what was it, cauliflower, broccoli was the medicine. <laughs> to cure something. If your body is able to synthesize something into something nutritional, it's nutrition. And the same way with this, and my, my theory is that if cannabis was available, it could be taken more as a nutritional supplement so that it could prevent your body wearing down and having to deal with uh, inflammation that eventually causes cellular dysfunction and onto different diseases. Do you want me to talk about the cancer no. before I go on? Please, please. Okay. I still would like to know what's the difference between cannabis. And you could claim that alcohol is a medicine. Yeah, alcohol is. is used as a suspension for medicine so that it enters the bloodstream very quickly. Uh, is there anybody who has an actual question? Well, yeah, just answer. <laughs> no, I saw an illness. Uh, so if. Uh, uh, <laughs> It has these very positive effects, which you've enumerated very clearly, um, and there's been a lot of research done on it, you know, behind it. Um, you, you have to wonder, uh, and, and this is what I'm asking you, does the alcohol industry and the pharmaceutical industry uh, do some pretty heavy lobbying against this being put forward? Because you'd have to think that. Yes, when we see funding going toward anti-legalization campaigns, it is for-profit prisons, law enforcement, alcohol industry, and pharmaceutical industry. Right. Yeah, so just what, a follow-up on that question would be this. Um, given that that's pretty obvious, you know, the same reason that, uh, you know, drunk driving laws, you know, the blood alcohol levels put up, at a rather high level for the average person with no tolerance. And that comes essentially from the same place. All of the damage that's done by these industries, uh, you, you would think that there would be more direct action or conversation directed against that component, you know, rather than just the appeal. You know, this is good. But, you know, saying at the same time, if you're going out and talking, I'm not saying for you to do it, but that you would actually bring this up, that what's really standing in the way is not necessarily 
research which has already been done, but we have some real heavy duty lobbying from industries which do a lot of damage on their own. I'd like to see that. What's the question? Yeah. Well, I, I, the yeah. question she already answered. No, I did, Charlie. She answered okay. it. She answered it. Yeah. Just, just remember, we, just remember we will have a rebuttal period. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Does the tobacco industry also What's contribute yours? to the anti-tobacco? Yeah. I don't know please. of any specific lobbying by the tobacco industry, but yes, they probably the do. They're going to Through be the whatever uh, yeah. organization, lobbying organization. So you've been waiting all night. Thank you. Uh, great presentation. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to, uh, like to know the difference between uh, uh, indica and sativa. Okay, this is a very good question. Because this medicine has evolved without the scientific analysis, indica and sativa are very common words applied to different types of cannabis. Now, indica is well known to make people sleepy. Sativa is well known to keep people up and make them more creative. Now, the truth is that I am going away from those labels because now we see that people get confused and they're like, oh, indica, that's the one with CBD. That's not the case. Well, the indica and sativa are very high in THC because they were derived during the black market era. The true difference between indica and sativa is sometimes a terpene called beta caryophylline and this affects the ability of the medicine to pass the blood-brain barrier and therefore give a very sedative effect. So, the, so we're getting a little bit away from that, and plus with indica and sativa, everybody's like, oh, it's all hybrid. This is a indica-dominant hybrid or a sativa-dominant <coughs> hybrid. But now that we're ha adding science to the program, we are able to analyze the THC and CBD percentages, then the primary and secondary terpenes that then have another effect on the medicinal quality. So it's just a more scientific approach. Great question. Now, we had a four-hour <laughs> argument when I was a freshman in college okay. on this stuff. Which one is better, Sensimilia or Hawaiian? <laughs> Sensimilia is, that Sensimilia means seed. And Sensimilia in the cannabis culture means no seeds. It has nothing to do with Hawaiian. Sensimia, I, I can see why you, you know, with tie stick, you hear things but back from the olden days. But, but high quality cannabis never has seeds in it because it's a, the female does not have seeds. And in the presence of seeds, the plant will stop extruding the high concentrations of medicinal qualities inside the flowers. So that's the reason why cannabis is grown with no seeds. Thank you for waiting. Well, uh, is it uh, going to be okay for people to grow cannabis in their front yards? Or? The current law in Illinois does not allow any home grow. There are, uh, California allows growing. And listen, this is, a, this is a social justice issue. We know that there should be people allowed to grow plants. As a matter of fact, before prohibition, this was a plant that your grandmothers had in their backyard. And if someone had a headache, or a stomach ache, they would brew a little bit into a tea, super low dose. They were not getting any psychoactive effects. So social justice-wise, we should totally have home grow allowed. But on that note, this is what I say. Let the pizza maker make the pizza. Because I can make pizza at home, but it's nothing compared to when I order it and it comes in 20 minutes, right? right. So when you get this high-quality medicinal cannabis, it is grown in a locked facility where they make sure there is no fungus. It is tested for bacteria, molds, mildew. They also restrict the chemicals. It has to be all organically grown. Then those products that are created, whether it's the dried cured buds or the extracted oils and put into capsules and edibles, all packaged, all sealed, all safety sealed, and then transported directly and safely to the dispensary. So if you want medicine, I go for the medicine that has been grown that way. So I have a question. I'm actually in the industry, and um, the point you just made about the people watching how it's grown, is that the state of Illinois watching the growers? I mean, who's, who's really watching what's being grown and then brought to the dispensaries? Okay, the government, the state highly regulates the growing meaning the testing requirements, the security in the facility, et cetera. And then uh, testing and retesting for the cannabinoid content 
So it's all overseen just as like any other regulations, okay? But the overseeing of growing of the plants are done by master growers and scientists who have years and years of experience handling these plants. So that doesn't answer your question? Well, I, you know, generally speaking, states are not particularly adept at regulating anything. I mean, particularly now, mm -hmm. given, you know, the restraints on government. So I'm just curious how pure the, the work is that the states are doing to watch that there isn't a weird strain that's grown. You know, those are the things that, you know, we are worrying about. Okay, the, I don't I mean, know does that there the would be a, a weird strain grown because any strain that's grown would be just a different cannabinoid and terpene content that would be processed and extracted for the medicine. But it's, in this industry, we are under such extreme watch. And everybody wants this to be so successful. Can you imagine people actually cutting corners and being like, okay, see, this is proof that you can't have a cannabis industry because you're a bunch of cheaters. So beyond the regulations that the state enforces, which are so intense that I've talked to people who work at dispensaries and they're like, we spend all day counting inventory in order to comply with, those, with yeah. the regulations. I'm not arguing with you no. about whether or not there is an oversight. What I'm saying is that states, who in the state of Illinois is watching the growers so that what's going to the dispensaries is pure? Is the department that's responsible for is that is the Illinois Department of Agriculture. Uh, then the Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulation oversees all the workers in the dispensaries. And then the Illinois Department of Health handles the issuing of cards to the patients. So those are the three departments that oversee all the regulations. Thank you so much for waiting. Yeah, I, I'm a patient that I can say that uh, well, what I get is pure. Uh, what, what I get in, in, in France when I visit the old country is laced with, uh, uh, with um, opium because it comes from Morocco. Oh, okay. And what, what, I, what, what you get here is the pure thing. How do you know? It's been tested. Oh, I, I, I know. It's, because I'm a, I'm a user. So I'm, I'm a patient. <laughs> What is the cost? Someone that, uh, mentioned to me, I think that they were paying $65 for an eighth of an ounce, mm -hmm. which seems like a lot of money for people who maybe are on disability or you know do not have very much of an income. Mm -hmm. Could you say something about that? Yes, I, the pricing, everybody asks about, great question. The pricing really now is set at black market prices, and this is why. If the medical cannabis is set at a lower price, then patients have an incentive to sell it. If it's priced higher, then the patients just want to stay in the black market and not join the medical pr program. So with the pricing at 65 and eight, very expensive, insurance does not cover anything. There's been some discussion about health savings account or having your accountant say it's a medical expense, so that's between you and your accountant. But with the pricing, if it's processed into an oil or capsule, that's gonna make the price higher because that's expensive to do that type of processing. But many patients have the option to buy something that's on sale or they work with flour and then they go home and cook it into edibles themselves. So that's an approach for the lower income patients to watch for what's on sale maybe buy a bag of shake, that type of thing that would be much, much lower priced. I'll I go over here. Thank you. Can you talk about how uh, it can be used to help members of the disability community manage their disabilities? Well, any, anybody who has a qualifying condition, absolutely. And what we're seeing is there's co-existing conditions typically with patients who have epilepsy they will also have some form of autism and autism has been petitioned to add and a judge has said you should add this to the program so autism not in our program but so many people see great results where the patient is more calm they're more focused more eye contact better in classes for physical therapy uh, much less um, nervous breakdown type of uh, activity so when we see patients who get their medical cannabis let's say for multiple sclerosis they also say oh my goodness it's helping me so much with this eczema that I had 
So there's many, many other conditions that a patient who qualifies for one thing, they can adjust their medication approach and their protocols to treat any other conditions that they have. I have a friend of mine who's been diagnosed with something called scleroderma, and I'm just not sure what that is, but would the medical cannabis be a relief in that case? Well, you're asking the right person because I think it's great for everything. <laughs> okay, but here's the thing. This is why scleroderma, I think, is a hardening of the skin. But the reason why I find it to be so effective for everything is because it is meant to regulate, stabilize, and balance all the systems of the body. So clearly, if there is a, an illness or a disease, that is a dysfunction, a cellular dysfunction. So if a person's body is not creating its own endocannabinoids like it should be, then it gets the supplement from the cannabinoids. And this is what patients say. They're like, oh, well, gosh, my, my blood pressure medication is working so well now because I have these cannabinoids, I can lower my dosage of blood pressure medicine. So I do feel I'm a big proponent. I think everybody should have access to it for no matter what they need to treat because it's clearly safe and non-toxic. Just a little bit of information about how to go about approaching it. I'll go back here just, sorry, okay, Tim. Okay, no, don't worry, don't worry. Yeah. You have a question? Yeah, yeah I, I write, Charlie. I write contracts for the International Association of Machinists. Do you think that I, these guys do precision work, do you think they should be able to smoke Cannabis yes, and I'll repeat the question. These time? union machinists, are they going to be impaired when they're doing these very technical and uh, dangerous jobs? Absolutely yes. And this is the reason why. First of all, with that psychoactive component THC, patients build up a tolerance to that. So they're able to, even if at the beginning when they start using it, they have some psychoactive effect, after some usage, they will not have that psychoactive effect at all. They will not be compromised or impaired. In addition to that, they are able to use a medicine that has a combination of CBD and THC, so there's no psychoactive effect whatsoever. As a matter of fact, we call this a positive side effect because let's say the person's less depressed. Because if you have a chronic condition, you're in pain all the time, and it tends to make people depressed. So when they start feeling better, then they might be a little less depressed or have a little less anxiety. But that's all adjusted in the cannabinoid ratio. So I have absolutely no problems with impairment. So, am I correct? I, I represent machinists and aerospace workers. So the mechanics of the airline being worked on at O'Hare they can use cannabis in their brakes? Let me go ahead and then go a little, another step further as far I mean, as you... they're working on airliners. Pointing or... out that they are union members. You have to de defer to the policy of the employer. If the employer says absolutely no federally prohibitive substances, then it doesn't matter how good the patient is or unimpaired. Sorry. Sorry. What's your the, opinion? What's my opinion? Absolutely. I know absolutely beyond the shadow of a doubt that patients are able to use this and not be compromised whatsoever. And on top of that, just to further the argument, think about how compromised people are when they're on opioids or benzodiazepines or SSRIs. Those people, there's a lot of drugs out there that the government doesn't have any problem with but definitely is known to compromise people and they want to get off them because they, these people hate being numb. They hate being sleepy all the time. They hate the side, the negative side effects of those pain medications, and therefore they switch to medical cannabis so that they can be more active and be more engaged in, the, in their lives and make more great contributions to society. The people who work on passenger airlines are not on narcotics. I can guarantee you that. Unless they're in Ohio. Not that question? Uh, I know. <laughs> I'd like to know how what you feel about recreational use of cannabis. I love it. <laughs> That's how I feel about it. Here's the deal. We, we discussed earlier that more than 88,000 people die every year from alcohol consumption. But it has been proven during prohibition of alcohol that it was nothing but destructive to everyone. People were still going to use it. 
they were making in their bathtubs. It was poisoning people. And then all the money went to the black market. So clearly, I haven't even touched on the opportunity for a complete industry to be made. To, and imagine where these cultivation centers are all out in the rural areas of Illinois creating more and more jobs. So clearly, the quicker we go to recreational, more social justice, less arrest, less negative effect on people's lives, and then we can reap the financial rewards of opening that up to, to everyone. And, and another thing is the same way with alcohol. As we became more publicly aware of the health implications, then there's less health damage. Same way with cannabis. If there is going to be misuse or accidents, that will be eliminated through public health awareness. Great questions, everybody. Okay. Um, so just going back to the black market and the pricing argument that you mentioned, doesn't that seem pretty unfair given the fact that uh, you know, you would expect that there would be some sort of a sliding, you know, not fee exactly, but scale for people who literally cannot afford that. And you think about, you know, when you talk about the, you know, it almost sounds like if we set it at a black market price, which is normally going to be reasonably high, then there's going to be more profits for us who are putting it out there. And uh, I, don't you think that's uh, not a very good argument, maybe? Well, honestly, if you could add up the millions and millions of dollars just through the regulation requirements that the people, there's, there's, you'll see talk on Facebook where like, oh, this is just another industry where all the rich people get to make all the profits and here we are left out. But it doesn't take into account how much millions to, to build these highly secure totally enclosed facilities. So when you talk about them making profits, they are a long way from making profits. The medicine has only been available for one year. So absolutely, the quicker you guys flap your yappers, the quicker we all get this normalized and feel comfortable recommending it and talking about it, the quicker that price will come down. And the people who are in this program, that 13,000, you are talking about a vertical market where the person had to have that qualifying condition, they could get, find a doctor to get him into it, and then they could afford all the fees, and then they could afford the medicine. So when you slice out that portion of the population, it's a very, very small group of people who can even afford to get in the program. Okay, so where is like the, uh, the Mayo Clinic or uh, like the New England Journal of Medicine, like the real high level of uh, you know, medical functions in this country, where are they at on this issue? They're all over the place. Uh, I think JAMA that you just m mentioned is they are like very good for treating pain. Now when they do their studies, they're doing it on one cannabinoid because they, they don't know how to prove that there's an effect, you know, definitively unless it's one cannabinoid or it could be one synthetic cannabinoid. So you can see how that limits their ability to see effects from the medicine. But definitely they're moving forward with, with pain. And as a matter of fact, a lot of people say, okay, so if this is such a great medicine, why aren't pharmaceutical companies on board? They want to do their traditional way. Isolate, synthesize, patent, and sell. And cannabis in its most effective form does not follow that script, so they're trying to squash it. But now there's a company called GW Pharmaceuticals and many other that are doing the research to make this medicine conform to that style of approval through the FDA process. And GW Pharmaceuticals will be the one that you'll see the most about because they have Epidiolex, which is 98% CBD, which is being used in the country in trials for children with untreatable epilepsy. Phenomenal results. They're also doing treatments for multiple sclerosis, which is half THC, half CBD, and GW Pharmaceuticals just started their treat, uh, testing on glioma, which is brain cancer. So there are companies following the traditional pharmaceutical FDA route in order to capitalize on this medicine. Okay. Yeah, uh, so my rheumatologist, uh, I have RA, and, and he says, uh, uh, you know, uh, in addition to the methotrexate that I'm drinking, and he says, you got to stop drinking. 
And I says, okay, well, well put me forward for a, a, me. For a cannabis card. And he says, you won't do that. And, um, well, why don't, uh, uh, you know, uh, people that, that are, so I had to go to uh, this guy at uh, Fullerton and Ashland. Yeah, Dr. You know, Harley. and uh, well, why wouldn't my rheumatologist uh, go along with uh, what, what okay. if he wants me to stop drinking, uh, okay, you know, put me. Uh, Give you an alternative, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, these are the reasons. Because there are conglomerate hospital owners, and they say, this is our policy. We have businesses in different states that do or do not have medical cannabis programs. So we lay out a blank statement for all of our uh, branches of hospitals and they say we do not allow our doctors to participate. Now I have confronted doctors about this and said, you know, what about the patient doctor confidentiality? I mean, it's nobody's business if the doctor signs and sends this, but the doctor feels if the patient were to say anything, their job would be on the line. So the, the doctor in their state of not knowing and understanding the program gets to fall back on the policy of their employer. Great question, thank you. Uh, you, thank you for waiting. Could you talk more about that family that moved to Denver? I'm very interested in hearing their story. Yes, this is Colton, is the son Colton Turner, and Wendy is his mom. And they lived in Jerseyville, Illinois. And when he was, I think, eight or nine years old, he had a drowning incident at a Boy Scout camp. He was in the hospital for a very long time with horrible, horrible infection. And they're like, well, this is what triggered your Crohn's. But then the Humira, which I don't understand these uh, immune suppressant drugs, the Humira was supposed to lower his immune system, and then that gave him lupus. So now he's working with both lupus and Crohn's and be feeling very, very bad. But he just had, I think, his 16th birthday, doing phenomenally well, traveling this all the United States, doing presentations to promote. And his saying that you guys will love, I'd rather be illegally alive than legally dead. That's what we're talking about. Thanks for waiting, John. Are there any studies that indicate the figures of lost days among employers where marijuana has been legalized? No, I haven't heard anything negative to that effect. They're still doing a lot of research in Colorado, and they're like, oh, we think we see a few more driving fatalities. But I, don't, I think that once the data has stretched out a little bit, they'll see an actual lowering of of that because people are actually using less opioids and less alcohol. You guys are great. Okay. When can we expect something like uh, the FDA blind trial research and can we believe it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I know that the GW Pharmaceuticals Epidiolex has passed its third phase of clinical trials for the children with Dravet syndrome. This is a, a, a type of epilepsy that shows no response to the traditional pharmaceuticals. That's why those children were chosen for the clinical trials here in the United States. And even those, those patients had zero response from all the other treatments available, they still saw a 50% drop in seizure amount. And here's the caveat, you know, I, I, think, I say to them, oh, did they get to adjust their dosage or did they get to add any THC to that? No, it's all CBD, all the same dosage to keep that static result to have a, a quantifiable diff result. Thank you. Yeah, I think they pulled the THC from that because that's the, the class one drug that they can't do scientific testing on. Now, I also wanted to ask, how do, how, what with the confusion between the federal government labeling it as a class one, employers testing for it, and being legal in the state of Colorado, how does that work out? I mean... It doesn't. The, the question is, what type of security, per se, would a patient have with it being legal in their state, but illegal at a federal level? A patient in Colorado did get fired from his job for testing positive. He took it to court and the Supreme Court said, your company is a national company, therefore they get to enforce any employer 
policy that they see fit. So we are just hoping that things will transpire quickly, but it, it's really an uphill battle to get more normalized, logical law application here. One more question. So for the same reason, they can't test the THC because it's a class one. So all the testing and scientific research being done in the U.S. is being done on non-THC? Well, GW Pharmaceuticals, that, that Epidiolex drug, it's 98% CBD. They did not remove any THC from that medicine. They started off doing that 98% CBD formulation because there were so many children who had gone. Have, has anybody heard of Charlotte's Web? That's a famous strain that's all high CBD. Because these children were refugeing to Colorado and getting great uh, epilepsy control with CBD, then they said, okay, well, then let's formulate this 98% CBD pharmaceutical for children. But they, they have one that's a one-to-one -one ratio of THC and CBD, and that's the one being tested for brain cancer right now. And I don't, I, you might be right, it might not be, be being done in the United States, maybe England. Uh, yeah, uh, this might be a, a matter of semantics, but you do talk about uh, you know, being stoners, uh, you know, and, uh, but there's a, a lower level, and that's uh, getting high. And uh, getting stoned is like getting wasted, and uh, getting high is, is lower than that. Well, yeah, yeah, it is semantics. And really, if you're talking about doing it recreationally, meaning you are uh, altering your mental state on purpose, <laughs> You know, people have the ability to do that after work with a glass of wine. So it feels good to know that they have this safer alternative as a mode of relaxation. And there's just so many great benefits to people having that, you know, that gentle peace of mind where at the end of the day and they're aggravated about something, they can be like, okay, in the big picture of things, it's not that big of a deal. So that peace of mind, if that's what is considered to be getting high from adult use or recreational, I'm all for that. Now, you guys have been wonderful. Should we go into the rebuttal period? We will. I got one more question. One more question. One more question. Why did you guys, why did you, what, can you give us your personal reasons for getting into this and what caused you to get to be such an advocate? Okay. My personal attachment to it, honestly, I felt vindicated because I was a person who thought the same things, you know, you think it's brain damaging, it's addictive. And I thought, oh my God, this is not going to give me cancer which by the way, I haven't talked about cancer yet, you guys got, got you guys all riled up. So I felt vindicated and I felt like, okay, well, I'm not gonna die of cancer from this. But another reason is that my family, uh, some family members had had run in with the law and I know that their lives were very negatively affected by getting arrested. That was another motivating factor that I felt like that awful social justice issue. Then the thing that really set off my studying and participating in this program was that my niece has lupus and she has seen the absolute limits of the medical profession she's been through absolutely everything and you know she still is getting surgeries and still trying to you know hip replacement knee replacement but she could not have black market cannabis because that high THC gave her rapid heart rate it uh, made her anxiety awful so once she was able to access true medicinal cannabis she found the best results with a four to one ratio meaning four parts of cbd to one part of thc and that's when i'm saying oh my gosh look at how when we really get this medicinal quality available then people can really start getting great benefits from it so great question tim okay. thank you rebuttals one more round for our speaker right. we have some time tonight how many are going to have rebuttals Tim, Tim, yeah. Tim, He's got Tim, a Tim, I have a question. Oh. oh I got one last, last, last question. Last question. All right. Question. I have one. All right. Uh, have you uh, done any studies uh, showing that, uh, you know, the widespread use of cannabis or the you know, legalization nationwide is being opposed generally by drug companies that feel they would lose profits on some of their drugs that are very expensive? If this, if the cannabis became widespread, it would cut into the pharmaceutical profit market. In, right? a, in my opinion, yes, there is resistance to it, but they're missing out on opportunity by doing that. Which what's, is what's being done to overcome that resistance in these big companies? Exactly what I'm doing here. If more and more people go to their doctors and insist on having access to this, 
then the doctors see the results, then the doctors will be compelled to do a little resistance to the pharmaceutical industry. And really, when we go down that rabbit hole, this is a disruptor. This nice. cannabis, if it's used and utilized and people get to have access to it, it really will be a disruptor to the traditional pharmaceutical role. But you know what? I'm not against pharmaceuticals. They have saved so many people's lives. And with cannabis added to that, it makes the pharmaceuticals work even better. So as opposed to it being an enemy of the pharmaceuticals, it's something that makes them even better. So thank you for your question. All right, all right. That's all right, all right. All right. All right. All right. How many rebuttals do we have? I got you. Yeah, one. <laughs> all right, Andy. Andy's going to take it from here. What's the microphone? But Bill has the microphone. I'll, I'll, I'll. I can go first. Okay. <laughs> you want to go first, Bill? I'll go right back. Okay. Uh, <laughs> let me have a show of hands. Uh, get a quick count. Who, who wants to do a rebuttal? Keep your hands up. One. Anybody over here? Two. Hands up, people. Three, four, four, like five people. That's it tonight. We'll go seven minutes each, Andy. Okay. Oh. Seven minutes each to start. Oh. And then uh, and Bill's first. Bill's All right, now first. Bill, you're gonna get up top. One thing that doesn't come up in marijuana discussions is that it took a, a constitutional amendment to prohibit alcohol, but we've never had a constitutional amendment to prohibit marijuana. And I, I think anyway, there were some court, court decisions in the 30s that said that uh, uh, drug laws, when the Constitution of drug laws was never established. Uh, I've come to realize lately that I've been maybe insulting the intelligence of this group for some years. <laughs> but sometimes it isn't too hard to do. <laughs> but anyway, I think people generally are generally aware that the rich get richer. Uh, and it's not always through a free market. They're, they're not building a better mousetrap. But they, there's no real theory uh, of how they do this. It's uh, very confusing. Uh, sitting, it's like unraveling the Gordian knot. And, uh, I think I, uh, I don't think we ever accomplish anything until we figure out how to get rid of the central bank and the income tax. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Who's got the next? All right. Remote? Let's get. Let's get. Let's get the mic up there, and we'll go in. Each got seven minutes. Uh, uh, Bill, can you give me the, the, the rest of your seven minutes? Did you no. Uh, no. 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 Seven God minutes is made you. with an allowance. I, I, I want to show you all something that arrived in my mail uh, three weeks ago. Is it legal? <laughs> it's a card. It's the Illinois Medical Cannabis Card. I'm lucky enough to qualify uh, for, for two conditions. So uh, yeah, you can you can thank me about that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, right. But uh, this stuff, uh, uh, my rheumatologist uh, a year ago, he asked me um, what works better for me, uh, the alcohol for pain relief or weed, and I said alcohol. And uh, but I went to the old country. I, I went to France in May. And people are sharing with me uh, Moroccan uh, hashish and Moroccan bud, and I'm feeling so good. And my joints, no pun intended, are feeling so good, and I'm sleeping so good. And I, uh, I got home and I said, what's the difference? There's two varieties, okay? There's, there's sativa and there's indica. The indica helps people with rheumatoid arthritis and sciatica. The, the, uh, the sativa, not so much. And I asked my friends, what do we party with? And they said, they said sativa. And I said, well, that, that explains it. That I, I, I've been having the wrong type of weed. And that's what, that was the basis of my response to my doctor. I wasn't having the weed. And uh, I live in Portage Park, uh, where it's, uh, 
it's easier for me to get weed than to buy a loaf of bread. Because I can go across the street and one door over and buy all the weed I want. Uh, but, but to buy bread, I have to go a block and a half. You know? So, uh, but, but the, when I buy the, the, the street weed here, it's, it's sativa, which doesn't suit me at all. Nine times out of ten at least, it's uh, sativa. Thanks. What you get on the street here in Chicago. Thanks. That's for sure. And um, I, I've been uh, you know, discovering this, and I'm, I'm on Monster Cookies, which I love. Yeah. And um, it, it's doing me so much good, and I'm getting good sleep. And I'm thriving, and uh, my joints, uh, no pun intended, are, are loosened up, and uh, it, 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 it's a great thing. Uh, the only thing is, um, you know, uh, going to another state and, and using it. Uh, uh, a friend of mine in Wisconsin says that there, there are many jurisdictions that will basically honor an out-of-state uh, cannabis card. But they're not, uh, you know, that's not per the law. They just like, like if you go to Madison, they don't care what you do over there. Because right? uh, uh, I, I'm going to Madison, I, I'm not going to Wisconsin to visit a friend. And uh, she says, no, you, you probably won't get into trouble. But I, I want to ask you a question about that. Am I going to get into trouble, you know, uh, taking my, my, my canopy to, a, to another uh, place? All right, all right, all right. Mikey, yeah, well, share I'll that card, you. man. Yeah, <laughs> I'll lend it to you. <laughs> <laughs> Who's next? <laughs> My fellow Americans, good evening. A wonderful presentation, but I have to rebut one comment that Kirsten made. Female plants should have seeds, unless the male plant does not pollinate. That's what sensimilia is, are female plants that we're not pollinating. Because if once the male gets to that, then they become very seedy. And that's what usually the, the Mexican sativa is. It is field grown where the males pollinate the, the females, and you get seedy weed. But under a greenhouse or something like that, where they can separate the males from the females, then the females will not bear seeds. Other than that, I'm all for it. Thank you. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> okay, next, I'll go. Who's next? I'll go next, Andy. All right. Get well, up there. Timmy. Uh, Charlie, now for a Give it to us, Timmy. Give us seven minutes. I'm going to take the full seven minutes because I'm going to, you know what Kirsten talked about tonight was a was a something that we all know about and could all go in. I wish you guys would feel the same way. You know, in a lot of ways, there's a lot of parallelism between what I thought about when I first learned about the thorium molten salt reactor. <laughs> yeah, boy, and yeah. the medical marijuana deal. It's it's somewhat illegal in the states, but it's uh it's a alternative that can help a lot of people. Yes, and. It, you guys could ever really do your research like I have into the uh, thorium reactor that would probably save our planet on climate change. I think you'd really go into it. Now, I'm going to explain a little bit about my own uh, journey in, into what it takes sometimes to get an alternative solution in. And there are many people doing it all over the place. I'm going to be giving a speech here in a few weeks on the parallelisms between the Chicago Cubs and what they did to win the World Series and what the Donald Trump administration means needs to uh, get a successful country. And you know, a lot of there's a lot of parallelism between it because what you see, like especially with this medical marijuana, a lot of people have learned about this. I've known about a lot of this stuff for years, you know, about the benefits and the alternatives, but, uh, and I do indulge very occasionally in, in it once in a while. Oh. I generally like to stay away from it. Uh, Why? What do you, what, oh, God. <laughs> anyway, I'm losing, I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> I just lost my train of thought. Oh. I wonder why. Was it heavy grass, Tim? Uh, 
Oh, it was Aleppo. It was Aleppo. Never mind. Anyway, my point is this. If you take a look at any endeavor, there is usually some form of a solution that might not be conventional, might not be traditional, but it can and does work. I honestly think that if you look a little deeper and a little bit more in the evidence and scientifically based stuff and what they've done before, you'll find a lot of it. Kirsten tonight fiendishly advocated for the use of uh, medicinal marijuana, and we know it's been around for quite a while. The other part I'd like to, to advocate now is the one of the uh, derivative of the plant called hemp, and it's rope, and it's in, 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 it's, in, and it's uh, complete. If I, Gary, you're going to have to help me here. Why don't you come out and give me a hand here, a little bit about uh, hemp and what it can do. Uh, hemp, hemp is the strongest natural fiber known to man. It's been used, uh, it's the oldest recorded use of plant material in the world. Hemp seed has the ability to reproduce more seed than any other plant in, its, in the world. I think that's one reason why the bankers don't like it, is because it can reproduce itself so fast that it will make agriculture uh, farmers rich and they won't need the bankers as much. That's my theory. Yeah. Hemp can be used uh, for uh, anything you can make out of oil, you can make out of hemp. Anything you can make out of wood, you can make out of hemp. You can make low cost housing with uh, uh, hempcrete, they call it. Uh, hemp does not require the chemical input that cotton does. We've all heard that cotton is king. Well, it is at this point because of the prohibition of hemp. The chemical companies have a lot of input into the lobby, uh, lobbying to keep hemp illegal because they want to sell more chemicals to grow cotton. Cotton takes a lot more water than hemp. If, uh, yes. If, if, Donald Trump really wants to make America great again. He'll go to Iowa, buy a farm, and grow hemp. Uh, I could go on and on. Uh, the carpeting used to be made from hemp. Some of the, bo the bottom is still made from hemp. It's imported from India or China. Canada can grow hemp. India, uh, uh, China, uh, Thailand is not going to be growing hemp. So why is America the only one of the G8 countries that cannot grow hemp? Did you know that hemp if it wasn't for hemp, we couldn't have invaded Europe in World War II because our supply of hemp was cut off. Uh, our Asian supply of hemp was cut off, so we didn't have any hemp. So all of a sudden, we started telling farmers to all grow hemp so we could make all the materials needed, the ropes, uh, the gliders, uh, the oils for the machine guns to invade Europe, uh, France. Uh, Normandy invasion was all because the American hemp farmers produced the hemp needed to make all the things made from canvas. Canvas is actually a derivative of cannabis. So I could go on and on and on about hemp, but um, yes. that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Jonathan! <laughs> Got a clock Thank here, Jonathan. Thank you very much to the speaker for an excellent presentation on an important topic. This is a scene from Easy Rider, 1969, uh, with Jack Nicholson, Dennis Hopper, and Peter Fonda. And they're sitting by the campfire talking. And basically, uh, George, the character played by Jack Nicholson, has just said, you know, I don't know what's happening in this country, you know. What happened? And I think that's what we're all feeling right now after this election. And uh, Billy, character played by Hopper, says, they're scared, man. They're scared. And George says, oh, they're not scared of you. They're scared of what you represent to them. Hey, man, all we represent to them is people who need haircuts. <laughs> oh, no, what you represent to them is freedom. But that was wrong with freedom. That's what it's all about. Well, yeah, that's right. That's what it's all about, all right. But talking about it and being it, that's two different things. 
It's real hard to be free when you are bought and sold in the marketplace. Of course, don't ever tell anybody that they're not free because they're going to get real big, busy killing and maiming to prove to you that they are. Oh yeah, they're going to talk to you and talk to you and talk to you about individual freedom. But if you see a free individual, it's going to scare them. Yeah, well, don't make them run and scared. No, it makes them dangerous. Neat, neat, swamp. Yeah, right, swamp. Uh, the Nixon administration was real clear about this. After the uh, country got way out of control <laughs> in the anti-war movement during the 1960s and the Vietnam War movement, and things got too civilized where ordinary people started to realize their, pol their power and solidarity, uh, they had to devise a plan to criminalize uh, the youth and the grassroots organizers, and they found a brilliant way. We'll criminalize drugs. So we'll basically uh, get rid of the hippies and the college students, and we'll get rid of the working classes and communities of uh, African American communities to make sure that we've got a pretext then to label everybody a criminal. And what we're seeing right now is kind of a, a re, uh, revisionist history where that was some kind of golden era, where that was a wonderful time of leave it to beaver, uh, cleavers in the household where everything was perfect and sanitized and uh, every, everything was absolutely Shangri-La utopian perfection and why don't we just rewind the clock and go back to that wonderful time. Problem is that didn't exist. That's just something that's uh, real, real deep in American propaganda where we like to talk about that on a si in silly season, as it's called, in campaign season, and forget that if somebody wants to uh, use marijuana for medicinal purposes or recreational purposes in the privacy of their own home, it's none of the government's goddamn business. Excuse that's me. Right, that's right. That's right. Here's another quote by Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, that kind of alludes to it. It's not directly on it, but I'll use it. Success, recognition, and conformity are the bywords of the modern world where everyone seems to crave the anesthetizing security of being identified with the majority. The hope of a secure and livable world lies with disciplined nonconformists who are dedicated to justice, peace, brotherhood, and sisterhood. Um, an alternative to what the system currently provides us with, which is more incarceration, more surveillance, more militarized police, uh, more wars without end for resource grabbing instead of genuine making the country safe, uh, would include alternative medicine, especially for the disability community that already has an uphill battle. And I was very encouraged uh, today by uh, the story about the family uh, who was just trying to live and, and make it through the day to day without this extra hurdle not being uh, a pretext for the government to make it even more harder for them uh, when they're just trying to live. It seems kind of ridiculous that they would find always a new way to find a new war on a new community that could be easily demonized as the other and identify that other as uh, the enemy, as a unifying cause, because that's one of the core uh, fundamentals of fascism. And uh, I just hope through this and many other ways of thinking outside the box and alternative ways of uh, reimagining an America that we all dream of having when we can truly call it a democracy, uh, we find a new, a new path away from those who would tell us to be afra afraid, afraid, afraid of something that's supposed to be on the 4th of July, something we're all at the core of, which is freedom. Okay. All right. Thank you, Rabbi. All right. up. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, what's All right, there? Charlie. All right, Charlie. right, let's thank our speaker. Thank you very much.
there's a book, a lot of alternative medicine people here. We haven't had a, a health evening in a while, so maybe we'll get some <laughs> more next year. I'll be eclectic as usual. Many of you remember, we haven't seen him in a while, our own Doc Wittort. And Doc Wittort came here every week and spoke uh, first, first guy. Uh, Doc Wittort actually was anti-drug. I still remember he brought, showed up with a, a whole barrel full of pill bottles. There must have been several hundred of them. And he poured them into a waste can. He said, you don't, don't take any drugs at all. And the people went to him, he said, he said, don't, don't take any drugs at all. So I guess he'd be on the other side of the camp here. The other thing is um, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Um, you're getting uh, off into the extraordinary there, but I saw the not much evidence. Uh, when I'm thinking of drugs like this, I'm talking to Huey Long. He, talk, he used to talk about a, a drug they had in Louisiana, Low Papalooza and High Papalooza. Low Papalooza was made from the bark at the bottom of the tree, and supposedly High Papalooza was made from the bark at the top of the tree. <laughs> Now there obviously is no difference whatsoever, but he used to talk about that as the offering in politics. Um, avoid anecdotal stories, those mean absolutely nothing to me. For every example, there's a counterexample, and one never arrives at the truth. Um, I used to listen to uh, Kay Myers, was my assistant, we had the bookstore there for 10 years, and was into all these herbs, and I listened to this herb herb cures for everything for 10 solid years um, and I developed something of a skepticism. I see drugs unfortunately advertised on television with all sorts of interesting sales effects and if you go up late at night you'll see the herbs being advertised and marketed uh, with quite a great bit of claims as to what, that's one about your manhood and things like this. <laughs> I, I know a lot. Uh, are there any longitudinal studies? I was tutoring a, a woman in junior, junior college and she was expressed to me that she was having a difficult time <laughs> studying and I inquired why and she said that she had been habitually using marijuana for at least 20 some years, every single day. And now she had taken a break and going back to college was experiencing severe headaches. So there are apparently, and I know there cannot be any longitudinal studies, so it's a, a thing. Uh, people in pain, um, unfortunately, I've never really experienced it. Uh, yes, they're going to seek whatever they can to alleviate that pain. Hopefully this will do something to alleviate it. and. I hope they won't be taken advantage of. Uh, there is a thing that we, why is this, the basic question I have, I mean, why isn't this treated like any other pharmaceutical drug? You get to the doctor, I mean, well, I went to the doctor, and they said, well, you need some, this drug checked for the first time in my life. Um, and they told, then I went to the pharmacy, and actually I've gotten to know the young lady that works in the pharmacy, as a matter of fact. So why do you need your own pharmacies? Why do you need your own apparatus? Why isn't this dealt with by regular physicians mm -hmm. uh, who are the ones entrusted to it? Uh, why do they have these stores? So there's something else operating here, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel why this isn't being treated in quite the same way as the rest of the drugs in, in the world, you know. Uh, why is it kept special treatment? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know why. But anyhow, um, the, the, that's basically it. Thanks a lot. I, I've got no real hard, hard issues to grind on this. Yeah, it, it's been called the victimless crime. And I guess the, the prisons are full of people who... Uh, the, the other thing, if you needed... If you could buy drugs across the street, why did you need the car? Because the, the other, why did you just go across the street? Why did you have to go to the suitable. doctor it and two doctors 
Come on, you. get yeah, out of here. Yeah, you're looking for variety. Yeah, that's yeah, 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 just go across I'm not the a, I'm not, I'm not a pothy. Come on, get out of here. Get out of here. All right. Who else has got a rebuttal? We got plenty of time. Let's go. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Mike is open here. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna bring up the Barney Miller episode. My name is Mike. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> David. First, I would like to thank you for a very informative presentation, and I agree with everything you said about medical marijuana. And for the most part, also with uh, recreational use. <laughs> but as somebody who grew up who went to college in the 1970s, uh, number one, most of us remember the Barney Miller episode in which they snuck in the brownies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was a good for a moment. No sooner did I discuss that with Carl, but he told me that Ron Glass would play Detective Harris die today. Oh. oh. No. Um, and also, when I think of recreational marijuana, well, what I tend to think of is what I saw when I was in college. Man, this is heavy grass. <laughs> <laughs> Cheech and Chong. Um, with regard to the comments that were made about using the drug laws to uh, put away hippies and all the rest of this, well, maybe some of that did go on. But people forget that drugs were illegal before that. That, for example, Billy Holiday got busted for drugs and they shipped her off to the Federal Narcotics Hospital in Lexington, Kentucky. And that hospital has since been closed and it's now the medical unit for the Justice, for the Bureau of Prisons. In other words, if you're a pris federal prisoner and you got medical problems, that's where you get sent, that's where you do your time. But nevertheless, anyone forget that classic film, Reefer Madness? So pot and other kinds of drugs have been have been illegal for a long time before the before the 19th, before, Nick, before Nixon became president. And also with regard to the comments that were made about father knows best and and um, what was the other one? Beaver. Beaver. Reflecting those times. No, those shows were made when I was an infant in the 1950s. <laughs> what they reflect is not my teenage years in the 60s, but back when Dwight Eisenhower was the president. And while things were not easy for everybody, blacks were only just starting to demand their just rights, and the same with other groups, it was in many respects a more quieter and more stable time. <laughs> it was. For one thing, Donald Trump was the president of the man there. Uh, you had the Korean War, you had, you had... The, but the, even so, it was quieter and more stable, though it was not necessarily a quiet or a stable time, just more so than what followed, which was uh, less stable and a lot less quiet. Um, thank you. David, just have to respond. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate 99% of your comments, brother. But uh, uh, Billie Holiday wasn't put away uh, just for for weed. Uh, she was uh, doing uh, heavier stuff too. I know. Uh, but the, they did make an example of Robert Mitchum. Yes. They called him the bad boy of Hollywood, and they put him away for using weed. Okay, um, uh, Cary Grant used to smoke weed walking down the sidewalk in yes. Hollywood, and uh, the, he was too big to make him an example, so they made an, an example of uh, Bobby Mitchum, who was a bad guy. And uh, the next bad guy was uh, uh, Jim Morrison. He was the, the bad boy of rock and roll, but before him, Robert Mitchum was the bad boy of Hollywood, and they put him away. And... Um, uh, why, why did they do that? Uh, they made an example. Who did they put away before Bobby Mitchum? They put away Gene Krupa. And uh, you, you should read uh, the uh, uh, online, uh, the, uh, the, the trial proceedings. Uh, the prosecutor is asking uh, Gene Krupa, so uh, did you smoke marijuana to get all hepped up so you could do your, 
your machine gun drumming? And he says, no, you stupid piece of garbage. We smoke marijuana after the show to come down, you know. He says, he says, there's no way I could do my drumming having smoked beforehand. And it just, you know, shows the stupidity, but, you know, once in a while they make an example out of someone. And so they made an example, they made the Krupa a scapegoat, and then they made the Bobby Mitchum a scapegoat. And that's, uh, that's how it works in this country. Anybody else have a rebuttal? Gary, you don't want to go. I just have one comment from Mark Twain. All right. What's going on What's the Charlie, I think Mark Twain wrote this for you. It's easier to fool somebody than to prove to them they've been fooled. Thank you. Okay, you got some of them. All right. Uh, uh, so much more efficiently than I have. <laughs> All right, ready or ready, Andy. Uh, I'm waiting for the laughter to die down. Here. Okay. I'll take the last rebuttal then. Um, Thank you. Albert Einstein had a famous quote. Um, he said, the human race is in a race between education and extinction. I'm not sure which side is winning. And that pretty much describes where we are today. And I, I thank our speaker for giving uh, one of the best presentations I've seen here in the last decade. Wow. <laughs> Don't believe him! Don't believe him! <laughs> That's funny. I don't know uh, if this is the first presentation you've given here. You know, if you come here you know, fairly regularly, you'll see that uh, this audience is generally unique for having, uh, you have people that are incredibly educated and knowledgeable on one or two particular subjects that they're expert in, but at the same time, they're maintaining themselves in a state of artificial flat earth ignorance and ignoring reality <laughs> and some other things. And it, it That's you make for yourself, Andy. Uh, since 2007, is the <laughs> Center News publishing a report in the United State about how the job of the media yep. is to maintain is, people in a general what you are bubble of mythology and ignorance <laughs> so that we don't know what's going on out in the real world. Uh, Americans, on certain subjects, Americans I are know. some of the most terrifyingly ignorant people on the face of the earth. And in today's world, right now, we're being force-fed a, a huge, monstrous, uh, pants-on-fire lie that the American public somehow voted Donald Trump as president. Uh, less than 25% of this country actually voted for Donald Trump. Yeah. He got less than 25% of the total votes, and the whole thing was jury rigged. Another thing, Professor Griffin, who has written, uh, for those of you that have been following uh, the forensic evidence scientists that have been publishing the forensic evidence since September 12th, uh, know that Professor Griffin is the Albert Einstein of his field, publishing the forensic evidence of what happened on 9-11 and how that myth was sold to us by the media. Every piece of what we've been told about 9-11 has been proven to be false. For how many people are aware of the International Lawyers Conference, like, like people that were you know, descended, some of them actually were old enough to be Nazi hunters after World War II, tracking down people uh, that are international war criminals. Those lawyers and people from the Justice Departments around the world, from The Hague, they had a two-day conference in New York uh, in September this year. How many people are familiar with what that conference did? Anybody? Nobody. Nobody. It, was, it was called Justice in Focus, and they, they had a list of names of the people, uh, they're preparing legal briefs and it was about what kind of evidence you have to present to actually arrest and prosecute somebody for helping orchestrate the events of 9-11 and then cover up the crime. And they had a list of names of the people that 
participated in the cover-up. That's the best that can be said. They were in, in a criminal cover-up. They started with the top 29 people in the Bush administration. Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Rice, uh, the whole lot of them, and some in the media uh, orchestrated the criminal cover-up after the largest real estate fraud in modern history. Seven buildings were destroyed in one day, and the media set up cameras to film the first two, and they sold it to us as a crazed attack by Muslims. Now, now we have, see, we have a heckler back there that is terrifyingly ignorant of basic reality, <laughs> and maintains himself in a state of second grade terrifying ignorance. If, if, if this were some kind of joke about baseball Chinese cards, dude. you could have a difference of opinion. But millions of people, millions have already died because of this myth. How many people are aware of which, which three countries are uninhabitable for humans now because of human activity since 9 11? America. Which, which, anybody know? Detroit. No, oh, uh, this is a, a, a serious question. Which three countries in the world can women not have healthy babies anymore? I don't know. Afghanistan, Yugoslavia, and Iraq. No we, more uh, we, we, on, on September 11th this year, uh, a friend and I from the Navy, we gave a presentation in Riverside Brookfield to the kids, and we, we gave them uh, a, a, a worksheet that said, what about the cloud? The first, re the first question you ask any military recruiter is, what do you know about the cloud? And if they look at you like you're uh, smoking something, you say, that's the cloud of radioactive dust drifting up out of Iraq heading around the world. Where there's uh, like 400 times more uranium particles been spread over the air, water, and soil in Iraq than what Hiroshima and Nagasaki suffered during World War II. That big cloud of radioactive dust is drifting up out of Iraq, heading around the world, affecting all mammal life on the planet, their ability to have uh, healthy, uh, non-deformed offspring. What our military has done since 9-11 is a giant crime against humanity all over the world. And the military is widely recognized now as the largest polluter on the planet, the largest killing machine on the planet, and the 800 bases are a trillion dollar burden on the people of the United States where if we puncture that one myth, do what General Butler said, bring the troops home, bring the troops home from everywhere and let them defend the 200 mile radius around America. With a trillion dollars a year, we could have universal health care, we could have universal free access to cannabis, education, all kinds of things. America could move forward and also we could get off of fossil fuels very quick. Incidentally, uh, in, in its brighter moments where you have lucid people actually facing reality, the U.S. military quietly recognizes now that the threat of, not the threat, the actual science, uh, the, the happening, the global change, global climate change is the number one threat against uh, uh, America and the world. So so you think it's okay for Russia to invade the Baltics uh, and take over Lithuania again, my homeland? Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. Seven minutes. Don't yeah. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we'll it's not your country. Do okay. So you don't care. Don't yeah, right. he doesn't care. It's time to get a point of the show. One, 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 one final note. As I said, the, the, the number one crisis is facing climate change. If we don't do that, nothing else matters. That's why we need thorium. That's why we need thorium. Okay. The speaker gets the last word. The speaker gets the last word. He's off the stage. Speaker gets the last word. Speaker gets the last word. Speaker gets the last word. This is just go. Okay. Hey everybody. Well done, Andy. All right, guys. Put it down. Let her talk. Is this on? It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. It's on. We can hear you. Guys, thank you so much for having me, Tim. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you to Charles for inviting me as well. 
It's an absolute thrill to be able to talk about this openly. And I do want to go as my last rebuttal is the answer to, oh, you know, if this is so great, why don't we just go through the normal procedures and get the science first and then implement that? My response to that is there was absolutely no science used when they were making this against the law. It was 100% lies, 100% propaganda, 100% motivated by greed and racism. So when we have to try to assemble the science, it's very, very difficult because that's controlled by the government that Im implemented the prohibition. As a matter of fact, the National, National Institutes on Drug Abuse would not accept any grant application if it was worded toward seeing what the benefits of cannabis were. So doctors, and I'll refer to one doctor, uh, Dr. Donald Abrams at the University of San Francisco, did an application for a grant because he wanted to see if it was benefiting people with AIDS. They were turned down for that grant. When he reworded it to see what the negative implications were for people using cannabis who have AIDS, then they received the money. So you can see why we aren't able to rely on the traditional pharmaceutical FDA, DEA route of side-by-side -side clinical trials while people are dying. They are not just dying of the diseases that we could be treating with them. Uh, anti-inflammatory they are dying from the actual pharmaceuticals that they have that people have no other alternatives to so many people say well the side effects of this medication are worse than the disease itself we do not have the time to wait while people suffer and there are so many other mental illnesses that can be treated with cannabis and that's another socially uncomfortable issue that we need to become comfortable with. So if I have done what I was intended to do tonight, it was to build your confidence in cannabis as a safe anti-inflammatory pain treatment and to feel so comfortable that you can talk about it openly. It's very easy to go to any other social event and say you won't believe the things I found out about cannabis. And then when you see someone who would typically be very against cannabis, suffering with a chronic condition. Sometimes it takes courage to talk to that person when you know that they are totally against drug use. But if you feel confident with it and you go get articles off of the internet based on the effects of cannabis on their particular condition, you have to have that confidence to say, I know how you feel, but please consider this as a safe alternative to use alongside of your other treatments. And when you get that feeling that you know that you help that person to have a better quality of life while they are dealing with a chronic condition, you know that you've made a valuable contribution to all of society because that person is not a throwaway. I believe in the value of people. They are not a burden to society. They are an asset. And when they are able to feel better and make a contribution to society, we have treated them with the value that they deserve. Thank you so much for having me. Right. Get out there and talk about yeah. cannabis. Go ahead and discuss it. Thank you. Right. This meeting at the College of Complexes yeah. has been adjourned. Uh -huh. Thank you.